Are, are you worried? Are there excessive l layers of, of complacency out there right now? I don't think so. Uh, with respect to Mr. Corbett, I, I think the markets uh, probably have the story correct. Global coordinated growth is what's happening now, and it's a little bit hard to derail that in a short period of time. I think we would all agree that a 10 percent correction is in the cards at some point. None of our crystal balls would tell you when. But I think the underpinnings of the economy globally are strong enough that that's probably a buying opportunity. And so I don't think Mr. Corbett's fear that we're sort of over-reliant is right in a grand sense. But in a shorter term sense, yeah, I think the crowded trade in the markets has become selling vol. Mm. That is the crowded trade. And I think that will reverse. Higher rates will generate more dispersion of companies, more volatility. And so as you see the 10-year in the U.S. climb towards 3%, you're going to see some more volatility in the market. And more volatility. How does that play into the active versus passive? I know you want to move the conversation yes, onto active and passive versus I'm, and. Very important distinctions. Yes. I, I think a lot of people think that passive and active are substitutes for each other. I think they're much more complements. It doesn't make sense in a world to have all passive. Passive isn't a good capital allocator. It free rides on the relationship between the stocks in an index that are set by capital allocators like active. I don't think passive is going away either. It's a good baseline choice. It's inexpensive, and it'll have a big part of the market on a go-forward basis. So the best asset allocators are going to use active and passive in concert with each other. And I think that's a good result for our clients. It's a cost-effective way for them to invest, and, and we support it. Well, so how do you charge for that then, Dick? What would be the correct fee for such an approach? Well, I think in general, active should charge a reasonable percentage of the outperformance it generates after fees. And you can do that in a number of different formats. In institutional market space, uh, performance fees make rather more sense because you have a long relationship with a client where they can adjust the fee that that client is paying you. In a retail market, it may make rather less sense in the sense that a shorter holding period means that if a mutual fund is constantly adjusting the fee that it charges, typically new investors are paying for performance received by other investors, and they may leave before ever paying the fee for their own performance. And so it doesn't work as well in a retail context. But in an institutional context, I think uh, performance fees are the right, right thought. Uh, you just have to have a reasonable amount of base fee because otherwise you're incenting too much risk taking. Yeah. So Dick, when a new client comes to you and says, okay, I like this idea of, you know, active and passive, maybe trading in and out of ETFs, how do you funnel their money? Where do you send it? Well, I think the first thing to say is we're optimistic about the future of risk assets right here in the global economy. So we think that you should be pretty close to your core base asset allocation, whatever that may be measured against your liabilities. And so we think investors, the difference between a professional investor and an amateur investor is typically staying with a framework. And so this is no time to vary from your framework. You need to be there. And then as you think about mixing active and passive, you need to think about how good am I at selecting active managers. If you're not very good, you'd have a, a relatively lower share of active managers. If you feel like you're pretty good, I think, and, and if you have a long holding period, I think you can be quite confident that a good active manager will deliver significant outperformance over the index and passive over reasonable time periods like five and certainly ten years. Dude, let's look at some of your calls, short vol, you've talked about. The euro, you see it continuing to strength against the dollar. Interesting call given that Thursday's the ECB and some waiting for Draghi maybe to try and put a lid on the euro. Will he? And if he does, will it make a difference? I'm not sure my crystal ball is that good. I think probably what he says won't make a big difference. I think he may try and put a little bit of a cap on it because so much of the European economy is obviously trade related and it's a challenge for companies that are trying to trade. Uh, but we've all seen Germany survive strong currency and, and, and still export their way out of it. So uh, I suspect it doesn't matter that much what he's going to say. He may try and put a little cap on it. The other call is the BOJ will be the only bank still easing yes. by the end of the year. Good timing saying that, given what Mr. Kuroda... I wrote that before. You wrote that before, before so I'll give you kudos. I'll give you credit <laughs> for that. Kuroda, for those who don't know, the, the BOJ governor saying today, you know, we're going to keep our foot on the easing pedal. But still many analysts saying later this year they'll start to maybe communicate or even just take a little bit of foot off the gas. What do you think? 
Well, I think that they may start communicating, probably not moving. Mm. Uh, but I think the, the growing optimism around the Japanese economy is a wonderful thing for the rest of the world. And, and uh, we believe that's a real trend. And, and our partnership with Daiichi Life at our company means that we have some insight into to what's going on in Japan. And we're very optimistic for, for that future. Well, you like Japan equities, but also China A shares. Explain that call to us, Dick, and how much should we be invested in China as opposed to emerging markets more broadly? Well, I think the question on investing in China is around the dynamics of how the A share market works. I think you have to be a professional investor. This is a case where I think you really need a professional asset manager. I know I'm self-interested in saying that, and some mm -hmm. of you may smile when I say that. But it's really true. The, the dynamics of that marketplace are challenging. The amount of information that's, that's released about the, the economy in China and those companies uh, is of a different quality than I think we're used to in, in the United States and in uh, the UK and in Europe and therefore I think you really need to watch yourself but if you have a really good professional investor I think uh, taking advantage of the fact that so much of the world's growth is going to come out of China is a, is a good and smart strategy.